You're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Now, if you are on the right, especially in the libertarian camp, you have seen Javier Millet. He is running for president in Argentina. He's got the big poofy hair and usually wearing a leather jacket, and he's very excited, right? He believes in uh, Austrian economics, and he is the great libertarian hope of South America. And I wanted to know a little bit more about him. Now, if you know anything about listening to this show, anybody that appeals to libertarians, I usually don't trust. I wanted to get somebody who actually follows libertarian politics in Argentina. And our friends at Young Voices helped me connect with Marcos Falcone, who is the project manager of Fundación Libertad and a regular contributor to Forbes Argentina. He's also a Young Voices contributor, and he's based in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And he spoke with me about the race for president of Argentina and this wild-haired, wacky guy that... And he spoke with me about the... Pre... And he spoke with me about the race for president in Argentina. He gave us a... And he spoke with me about the race for president in Argentina and told us a little bit about Javier Millet, his background, if he's going to win, what is the vote like, and how does it operate in Argentina, and also... What is the economic crisis that led to a South American country heading more libertarian as opposed to the socialist direction, which we have somewhat often seen? So, more. If you're curious about this story, and I think you will be, it's fascinating. And there's also a few lessons for American politics in this. So stay tuned right here on The Chris Spangle Show after these words. We run on the value for value model here on The Chris Spangle Show and the We Are Libertarians podcast network. That means... Do you get value out of the show? Do you learn something that helps you sound smarter when talking with your friends? Do you feel a little bit more connected to the world and inspired to do something a little bit differently? Well, then please give some value back. And the best way that you can do that is through our Patreon. You can go to supportcss.com or patreon.com slash we are libertarians and you can join our Patreon. Not only do you support the program and the entire We Are Libertarians podcast network, by helping pay all of the bills, you're also going to get ad-free shows. You're going to get early releases, sometimes months in advance in terms of episodes that haven't been released in the public feed yet. You'll also be able to get the full archives, the full RSS feed of all the past episodes. And there's even a tier that you can come on the show or you can have your name mentioned every episode like I am about to do right now. Thank you so much to our $100 a month members, especially Vincent Pykel, Matthew Durbin, Jason Doolittle, Christy Avery, and our good friend Ryan Hold. Thank you so much for supporting us, and we appreciate everybody that considers making a contribution today. Marcos Falcone, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Chris, for the invite. Now, I'm an ugly American, I admit it. I like foreign policy i like following other countries and their governments and form of governments and but at the end of the day there's only so much you can follow and i don't know anything about argentinian politics and with the rise of ha- javier malay in america there's this thing where libertarians go oh, he's on my team so i'm gonna root for him but we don't really have the context of it i when they go to the polls in october on october 22nd and folks have a chance to vote for two liberal candidates. What does that mean in the context of Argentinian politics? This is uh, a unique situation, I would say, in Argentina, in that you have two candidates that are rooting for liberalization of the economy. The reason why we got to this point is because of the terrible results that interventionism, economic interventionism has brought to us, and that is represented by the current Minister of Economy, who is also running in this election. And some polls are saying he may be in second place now instead of Patricia Bullrich, but his coalition came third in the primary election in August. So that's why I'm focusing on Millet and Bullrich, who got first and second place, or their coalitions got first and second place in the primaries. The reason why these two candidates are as strong as they are is, as I was saying, the disaster that Argentina finds itself in. Right now, we have an annual rate of 100% inflation, basically. 
that is very bad. You go to the supermarket and prices go up on a weekly basis. People see that. People also see that their salaries are not going up as much. And so people are starting to get really fed up with the government, but not just with the government, but also with the political elite, so to say. And that is actually hurting Patricia Bullrich. That's why Millet is running first right now and not Patricia Bullrich, because Patricia Bullrich was the Minister of Security of former President Macri between 2015 and 2019. She has been in politics for over three decades, whereas Millet is a new figure. He is a self-described anarcho-capitalist, clearly a, a libertarian. Some people could argue that he's more of a conservative uh, libertarian, and, and I think that's true. He also has inclinations that, that make me wonder how libertarian he actually is, because, for example, his running mate is a known advocate of nationalism and of Catholicism, and he's she's very likely anti-liberal in everything that has to do with economics, for example, which is the complete opposite of Javier Millet. But the thing is, uh, Millet's campaign is centered on him. The message that he is conveying is exclusive to him. He is the only one talking about economics, and he is talking about deregulation, about cutting taxes, about lowering public spending, because what we have today is basically a fiscal crisis, which we can talk about later. And he is putting forward very, how can we call them, strong proposals or, or very abrupt, controversial solutions to the problem that, that Argentina has today. He wants to dollarize the economy. He is saying that we need to shut down the central bank altogether. But Patricia Bullrich is saying, no, we don't need to shut down the central bank. We don't need to dollarize. We just need an independently run central bank, which we don't have and we haven't had for decades, to tame inflation, along with also deregulation, lower taxes, lower public spending. But the difference is basically the speed with which both candidates want to go. Millet is saying we need to cut 15 percent uh, uh, of public spending in just one year. Borch is saying that's impossible. And it's going, and even if you can do it, it's not going to be sustainable. And so the discussion is basically about the speed of change rather than whether to implement change itself. And I'll uh, give a link to this, your article in EconLib about this. It seemed, and I don't know if you're familiar with Cato and Mises and kind of the split in the libertarian movement where it almost sounded like Malay is the Mises candidate and Bullrich is the Cato candidate. A little more comfy with sort of the system and more of a reformer where Malay is more of an aggressive libertarian. But what a great choice for your country to have those two choices. Is that a fair analogy for an American listener? Maybe today it can be, but... In Bullrich's case, I don't think that she she's a truly libertarian candidate. She's just basically center, and the political conditions of Argentina right now have driven her towards economic liberalization, but she could have just as well represented the opposite 10 years ago or 20 years ago. She, is, she does smell what's going on, and she does adapt, but I'm not sure Cato, for example, would be comfortable with her. I also think that if we're talking about Cato or Mises, I think Cato would be very glad about Millet's economic proposals too, because Millet is talking about, for example, school vouchers for education. And of course, he's talking about dollarization, shutting down the central language Cato would also support. But in some aspects, it is true that Millet shows conservative traits that you could link to, to the Mises Institute. That's true. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about what led up to this, because it's an extraordinary moment where I think the American political mind would go, it's, we're never going to, we're always going to progress towards authoritarianism of some sort, left or right. We'll never get to a point where things are, where people are crying out for more libertarian solutions. But I think that's one of the hopeful pieces in the story is that it, you know, once once things got bad enough, people went, all right, too much big government. So what led up to this? What is the fiscal crisis 
that led up to this and how did the country get to a place where they're even entertaining more libertarian liber liberal classical liberal solutions in what you call liberalization Argentina has basically seen how the government has expanded up until the point where it became unbearable just for everybody and just to give you one indicator that will sum this whole thing up public spending has doubled in the past two decades. Public spending as a percentage of the GDP has doubled from something like 22-23% to almost 45% in just two decades. That has meant, of course, that taxes have gone up significantly to pay for that expansion, but not even increasing taxes has been enough. And so the government has resorted to borrowing money first, and then when nobody else would lend money to Argentina, because Argentina also has a history of defaulting on its debt, they just resorted to printing out money, which is what has gotten us to this inflation rate that we have today. Inflation is today at 130%, uh, but it's going up. It's It hasn't stabilized, and it's not likely to stabilize itself either, just because the deficit is still there. The government still can't pay for whatever it wants to fund. And so the origins of this fiscal crisis are still here. And they are the reason also why many are entertaining the possibility that Argentina goes uh, into hyperinflation. This is uh, a scenario that Millet, for example, is discussing uh, publicly, openly, but also Patricia Bullrich and also all of their uh, economic advisors. They're saying that with the measures that the current Minister of Economy is taking, for example, because right now in the middle of the campaign, he is lowering taxes and increasing spending, those measures are taking us to hyperinflation sooner rather than later. And by sooner, this could mean this very year. Particularly so just to clarify, the guy that is yeah. running who's in second or third place is in control and has lowered taxes and raised spending in an effort probably to get himself elected, I would guess. And that's making exactly. the crisis worse. This is making the crisis extremely worse. He has he has taken basically two measures that have worsened this crisis. He has basically eliminated income tax for only about 10% of the people paid income tax before this reform in Argentina. But now it's only going to be like 1%. And so this is a reform for the wealthy, so to say, that is going to be disastrous for, for balancing the budget. And then he is also uh, implementing a program that returns the, the key tax when you go to the supermarket just for everyone who pays with a debit card. Those are measures that in other contexts we would all celebrate, but that we know that they're making this crisis worse because he is not reducing uh, government as he does this on the country. He's spending more money on public works. He is increasing government handouts just to get himself elected. What I ask myself is, if he's doing this right now to get himself elected, how on earth could he deal with this afterwards? But I think that's a question that he's not asking himself because he knows that he's not getting elected. He knows mm -hmm. this is between in Millet and Bullrich at most. And he's probably just trying to get the people to like him enough for him to run again in four years. Okay, so I know when hyperinflation hit Venezuela, for instance, they went more socialist. So what are the conditions in the country or in the media that, or, or is there a political structure that, like in Chile, Milton Friedman came and visited and all of a sudden now everybody's very libertarian, right? Why is it that this seems to be leading libertarian and more anti-government than pro-government as we normally see in these situations? I think the charisma of Javier Millet has a lot to do with this. I think he has been a great figure on TV, for example, on social media, and he has brought this message of economic liberalization farther than anyone else in the classical liberal or libertarian movement in Argentina. Of course, he's not perfect. He has faults. He definitely has. He actually blocked me on Twitter a few weeks ago because I <laughs> criticized him. Yeah, uh, I criticized her, his running mate, who is not libertarian at all, right. and he blocked me. 
in terms of economic liberalization, he has been a good a good figure for Argentina. And his style, this controversial style where he keeps yelling and saying things as they are, basically, which is also the reason why he sometimes gets compared to Trump. Mm. But, but I think that's not an exact comparison, of course. I think that has made that it, that has made it possible that he has a chance today of getting elected because uh, it's true, as you say. I think we're very lucky that just people getting fed up with the government didn't didn't result in in, in a far left candidate, for example, taking thirty percent vote. But I think Malay's charisma definitely has a lot to do with that. Two libertarians arguing over economic policy and blocking each other is the most libertarian stuff I've heard all day long. So what is his background? Where where did he just come out of the libertarian ooze wearing his leather jacket because he saw Nick Gillespie doing it? Or is he a business guy, a political guy? What's his background? He's an economist. And before joining, before jumping into politics, he was the chief economist at one of Argentina's largest media co- uh, corporations. He's actually, he was, he worked for a businessman who owns many corporations in different areas, in the media, but also in airports, for example, which is why he has been criticized because this, this businessman is one of the crony capitalists that he is supposedly trying to get rid of. But he used to be chief economist for his group. And then he jumped into politics. I met him personally 10 years ago on a trip to Tucumán in northern Argentina. He was traveling along with former Minister of Economy, Ricardo López Murphy. He is an experienced politician, and he was taking him to places to talk with him. They were giving talks together. And from there, from speaking at events at think tanks like Cato or Mises, but in Argentina, he started going on TV in one of the TV channels that is owned by his former boss. And from there, he created a political, not a party, but a coalition. And he got 17% vote two years ago as he ran for representative for the House, representing the city of Buenos Aires. And that's also why people didn't really think that he would come out first in the primary. But he ended up being a surprise, basically because he received uh, many votes outside of the city of Buenos Aires. So in the wealthy areas of the country, in, in the wealthier neighborhoods of Buenos Aires, for example, he does not get a lot of votes. He gets votes where poverty is higher. He gets votes in northern Argentina, in western Argentina, but not, not in the center. That's a curious phenomenon that some people say has to do with his rhetoric because he acts like a populist. But, of course, we could debate whether that's true or not. But that's what's happening. Do you trust him? In the sense that, let me explain that a little more. I, I, Anybody that appeals to libertarians now after being one for the last 20 years, I don't trust them. <laughs> that, that seems to be like, the right seems to be easily fooled. So anybody that comes along, I go, all right, I don't know that I trust Elon Musk. Right, just because he says libertarianish things doesn't mean that he fully understands these principles. If he gets elected, do you think Javier Malay will follow through on these principles, or is this just bred into him to a level that he can't be anything other than the next Ron Paul, or is he an operator and you, you're just a little? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where I feel fit, feel with him. I have mixed feelings. I think. I think his libertarian ideas are real. I think he has the right ideas in terms of economics and and other things too. But I struggle to see how he's going to build a coalition that will sustain him and that will cause him to follow through on his promises. And I also think that he has promised, he has made promises that are very difficult to follow through, even with legislative support. So I'm not sure up to what point I trust him because of what he's saying, but I also understand he's a politician. He needs to win elections, basically. He needs to appeal to a majority. But I think his libertarianism is real. And I actually, we actually witnessed his own internal change. He used to be a monetarist. He used to be a follower of Milton Friedman, Gary Becker. Then all of a sudden, he started reading Mises and Hayek, and he turned Austrian. And I think that was genuine. And I think he's an Austrian guy. Absolutely. I just 
I'm not sure about his judgment. Okay. Worry that he, for example, tomorrow he might find some other writer who is not as libertarian and maybe change his ideas again. For God's sake, keep will. him away from Hoppe. <laughs> I think I think he has right the right ideas right now, uh, but I'm not sure about how he's going to follow through on his promises or whether he's going to change those ideas in the future. So can you give us the dummy's guide to your electoral system? There was a primary, and then you've got on October 22nd, the vote. And how much do you trust your vote? Like, how reliable is the electoral system there to ugly Americans? South America, Argentina is a very developed country, Brazil, very developed. But we tend to get stories of banana republic frauds and that kind of thing. And I know that's probably, I don't mean to be offensive, but that's just how uh, the American press reports all of South American politics is that you really can't trust these votes. Can you give us an understanding of both of those? Yes. Tina is pretty reliable when it comes to elections. There are places that are better than others. The the city of Buenos Aires, for example, you you would trust results 100% completely. Maybe in some provinces in northern Argentina, I'm not sure they, they can commit fraud exactly, but there is definitely vote by in, 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 places that that are full of poverty. But overall, I would say that the election is pretty, elections are pretty reliable. We had a primary on August 11th. The way this works is funny because it it makes it seem like a general election, basically, because voting is mandatory. But this is a chance for coalitions to do an actual primary. And for example, Patricia Bullrich actually ran against Buenos Aires mayor, Horacio Rodriguez Larreta, and she beat him. But their coalition got Uh, 20% of the vote and finished the second place. I think Javier Mire, for example, faced no one, but he had to stand anyway uh, because everyone needs to run. And results are like a pristine poll of what's going to happen in the general election, which is taking place October 22nd. Then in in a few weeks, if no candidate surpasses 45% of the vote or 40% of the vote with a 10 point difference with the second one, then we're going to have a second ballot on November 12th. Right now, the polls indicate that is the most uh, likely scenario. Uh, but some people are also saying that Millet may actually win in the first ballot. Of course, to do that, he needs to get a lot more votes. He got 30% of the vote in August. He would have to get to 40% and hope that nobody gets to 30 which is difficult because Rich's coalition got 28 Massa's got 27 and some candidates were, have dropped out. That it, it, it is a possibility that Millet win in the first ballot, but I think today that is not as likely as a second ballot. So we will have to wait until November 12th to see what actually happens. Okay, so just to reiterate to make sure that I'm clear, parties run in the primary and then select their candidate. He's in a different party is an established party a new party? Is it just him as an independent and then he's forming a party? Millet's party is basically just him. Okay. It, it did not exist before him. It will likely not exist after him. Okay. It's just a, it's just a, a made up party that he's using right now. Whereas the other coalitions have existed for the past decades, I would say. It just bends the American political mind. The, a guy just stood for election and now it's beautiful. I love it. And so then those three candidates or will there be multiple candidates in October and then do two, the top two move to the November ballot or do all the no, candidates stand again? It's basically everyone except for those who got less than 1.5% of the vote. Gotcha. Uh, which is a lot of people. But so the result is that five candidates are standing now. It's Millet, Bullrich, Massa, the Minister of Economy, and then two others. The governor of Córdoba, an important province in Argentina, who is running at like 4% of the vote in the polls, and and the far-left candidate, who is also running at 4% of the vote. So how many ballots will they do? How many elections would they hold before they just go, look, nobody's getting to 45%. It's just going to be the October one. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. This has all been very interesting. I'm interested to see what happens now that I understand a little bit more. Thank you so much for your insight. I've got a question that's a little bit different, somewhat related. So I was having a conversation. I just don't know who else that I could ask that has your frame of reference. Immigration, obviously, is a big discussion here in America. And I was talking to a libertarian friend, and they said, look, we've got to keep closed borders and tight tight immigration controls 
because of culture. And I said, that doesn't make any sense to me because people from Latin America generally are entrepreneurial, are family oriented, are Catholic. The cultures are pretty intertwined for somebody who especially is on the right. They're pro-life generally, right? I was like, what do you mean? And they said they tend to vote socialist, which means this person's a vote protectionist party protectionist. Just look at the Cubans. That's not true. <laughs> right. right. So what's your perspective on America? Immigration needs to be closed because everybody south of Fl Miami basically votes socialist. I, I, I think that's I a very be, hegemonic view. I think it's, yeah, you know, if you've never I, been I think, south. <laughs> I tend to be uh, pro um, open borders. Um, but I think that people who go to the U.S., have a special mindset, so to say, especially those who risk their lives as they go. They want to go to the U.S. because they want to prosper, because they, they know that the American dream has to do with working, with being independent, with creating wealth. I don't think anyone is really immigrating to the U.S. because they want to live off of government subsidies. I've, I have never had I've never heard such a case. So I, I, I don't think that people who go to the U.S., would necessarily tend to vote socialism. That may be true for some, absolutely. It, it may also be true for uh, Americans themselves, depending on the, uh, on the definition of socialism. But I think we have seen crystal clear examples of communities that just don't vote for socialism, like the Cuban community, for example, They're, or the Venezuelans. I'm not sure how many Venezuelans can actually vote in the US, but I think if you track them down, they would probably not vote for socialism. They literally fleeing from socialism. So why would they vote for socialism as they get to America? All right. I appreciate your perspective on that. Thanks for indulging me on the question. Shameless self-promotion time. Where can people follow you if they want to learn more and follow your commentary in the elections? Yes, they can access my website. It's my name and my middle name, basically, marcosfalcone.com.ar. And you will find everything on there, my Twitter handle, all the pieces that, I'm, that I publish on U.S. media, Argentine, Argentina media, and yeah, whatever updates I have. All right. Wonderful speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Chris. And thank you for joining us. If you found this interesting, please share it with your friends. Help spread the word. That helps both Marcos and myself. And we thank you for joining us here on The Chris Spangle Show.